an angel of light. An angel of light. I think we all know the scripture. 2 Corinthians 11.14 says, And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. And that was from the King James Version, and I don't like it as well as some of the other translations. The word transformed is from Strong's number 3345, and it means to transfigure or disguise. The way the wording is in the King James, it almost sounds like someone else is doing the transforming of Satan. And who would that be? But the thought here is that Satan is disguising himself as an angel of light. I like the NIV on this. It says, and no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. And that thought is very different than what we find in Romans 12, 2. And it reads in the King James, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The word transform in this text is Strong's number 3339, and it means to transform or metamorphose. Two different words, two very different concepts. Satan disguises himself. And the faithful follower of Jesus actually change into something else. The question is, why would Satan want to transform or disguise himself? And in particular, disguise himself as an angel of light. Well, that's not a very hard question, is it? Isaiah tells us in chapter 14, verses 13 and 14, For thou, Lucifer, Hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Lucifer, who later came to be called Satan, was an ambitious fellow indeed. But notice something interesting in this text. It says that Lucifer wanted to be like the Most High, not necessarily greater than him. When someone wants to be like someone else, what do they do? They emulate that person. And how would Lucifer or Satan go about emulating God? Well, 1 John 1.5 says that God is light. This, then, is the message which we have heard of him, and declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. So, Satan then, if he wishes to be like God, must appear as light, so that he can appear to be like God. His problem was that he didn't want to be entirely like God. He only wanted to appear like to be like God, so that he could convince us mere mortals that he was God. By doing this, he assumed he would ascend to the same level as the Most High. But he wasn't interested in using the whole spectrum of light, just parts of it. That's why he transformed himself by disguising himself rather than transformed himself by changing himself. Big difference. Satan felt that he had the wisdom of God. But he wanted the power of God and the station of God. He was not interested in the mercy of God or the justice of God or the patience of God or especially the love of God. In other words, he had no clue what makes God so great. But he also knew that he could easily have power over human beings, power to coerce, power to control them, to do his bidding. Evidently, he felt that this would make him like the Most High, or at least to appear like the Most High to human beings, because what he really wanted was to rule over them. The word Lucifer in Isaiah 14.12 means the morning star in the sense of brightness. The RSV translates it, day star, son of dawn. This strikes me as interesting because, as we have noted in 2 Corinthians 11.14, Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Well, 
why would he need this disguise if he already is the morning star in the sense of brightness? Well, the word that comes to my mind here is greed. Lucifer had it all, but he wanted more. And that's never a good attitude. So, Lucifer started out as the morning star. And in the vernacular, we might say he had it all, but it just wasn't enough. And what we're going to do now is to go way back in time and see how Satan disguised himself as an angel of light. We know that the spirit of Antichrist was around in the very early days of the church. First, in 1 John 4, 3, we read, And this is that spirit of Antichrist, where ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. And we know from Acts 20, 29 and 30, that Paul expected grievous wolves to enter into the flock. And even those from the church would speak perverse things to draw away disciples after them. After the apostles were all beyond the veil, the grievous wolves got very busy. I'm going to read you some excerpts from an essay entitled The Papacy. It's history, dogmas, genius, and prospects written by a Reverend J.A. Wiley to show how Satan got things started. Quote, The first pastors of Rome, of the Roman Catholic Church, aspired to no rank above their brethren. As pastors, they watched with affectionate fidelity over their flocks. They were led to embark in this undertaking, not from the worldly and ambitious views which began in course of time to actuate their successors, but from that pure zeal for the diffusion of Christianity for which these early ages were distinguished. Advice was at first purely paternal and implied neither superiority on the part of the person who gave it nor dependence on the part of those to whom it was given. And now this is where the article starts to get interesting and to the point. But in the process of time, when the Episcopate at Rome came to be held by men of worldly spirit, lovers of the preeminence, the homage, at first voluntarily rendered by equals to the equal, was exacted as a right, and the advice, at first simply fraternal, took the form of a command and was delivered in a tone of authority. These beginnings of assumption were small. But they were beginnings, and power is cumulative. And thus the pastors of Rome, at first by imperceptible degrees, and at last by enormous strides, reached their final, their, excuse me, reached their fatal preeminence. Such was the state of matters in the first century. End quote. Paul's words and Reverend Wiley's words make a lot of sense in light of other scriptures. There is a prophecy in Jeremiah that I have a hunch Paul and Reverend Wiley knew about. Jeremiah 51 verse 7 says, Babylon hath been a golden cup in the Lord's hand that made all the earth drunken of her wine. Therefore the nations are mad. And Revelation 17 4 says, And the woman was arrayed in purple and in and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Do you see the subtlety here? In the prophecy in Jeremiah 51, Babylon was the golden cup. In Revelation 17, the woman, who we learn in verse 5 is Babylon the Great, has the golden cup in her hand. Brother Russ tells us in reprint 5092 that the cup suggests that the unfaithful church had once been the receptacle of divine truth, end quote. But eventually, the woman, or false church, actually took the golden cup and filled it with abominations and filthiness, a total usurpation and subsequent misuse of God's word. The conventional wisdom in the early Roman Catholic Church was that since Rome was one giant empire, why couldn't the church be the same? 
and the thirst for power and control grew in Satan and men. During the first, second, and third centuries, the church had its share of persecutions. It was the same for the papacy, for they were considered Christians at that time, of course. But papacy survived the persecutions, even the widespread persecutions by Roman Emperor Emperor Decius in the year 250. It seems that Satan was looking after his false church, just as our Lord watches over his new creation, protecting it, nurturing it. In 312, Emperor Constantine led the forces of Rome to victory at the Battle of Milvion Bridge. The night before the battle, Constantine had a vision that he would achieve victory if he fought under the symbol of Christ. This was an illicit marriage of the false church to the Roman Empire. And so it was that the illicit union of the false church with the civil government was consummated. Here's another quote from Reverend Wiley. In the year 378 came the law of Gratian and Valentinian II, empowering the metropolitans to judge the inferior clergy and empowering the bishop of Rome, Pope Damasus, to judge the metropolitans, end quote. And it seems the hierarchy was solidified. Under the name of God, Satan's church grew in numbers, worldly power, and worldly wealth. Here's even more from Reverend Wiley. Instinct must be with a divine life, Otherwise, how could she survive so many disasters? No wonder that the blinded nations mistook her for a god and prostrated themselves in adoration, end quote. And how true that was. Now, this brings us to the middle of the 5th century, the Middle Ages. And now it was time for Satan to do some big-time marketing. And what I'm hoping for now It's just a little bit of audience participation. I would like you to imagine for a moment that you live in the Middle Ages. You are a peasant or a serf. You pretty much work from sunup to sundown to make a meager living. You have almost no worldly possessions. You live in a world where the power of armies is valued more than anything. Education exists only in the Catholic Church by becoming a monk. All knowledge came from the Bible. Knowledge from any other source was considered heresy and was often destroyed by the church. There was a complete lack of democracy. There was no middle class and there was a huge class of poor. The Catholic Church ruled with an iron hand over everything, including the governments. No wonder that this time has also been dubbed the Dark Ages. As you approach a massive cathedral, you think to yourself, this must be of God. If you are fortunate enough to enter, you are in awe. This must be what heaven is like. You hear a priest speak to you and to God in a language you don't understand, but he is saying these words with such confidence and with such reverence. This must be God's language. This must be God's house. This must be God's throne for you to experience right here on earth. You gladly put what little money you have in the coffers to support this wondrous heavenly beauty. Whether you are one of the few noblemen or one of the many poor, you will come back until the day you go to the real heaven. Even though you have actually learned almost nothing about God and his promises there, the one thing you have learned very well, however, is that if you don't go to church and pay your money, you will burn in a place called hell forever and ever and ever. What a stranglehold the church had on the people. In the cathedral, you saw magnificent architecture, statues, stained glass windows. You hear beautiful music from the choir loft. With these sights and sounds, you were in awe every time you enter this place. What a contrast this is to your daily existence. All of this was designed by Satan, and he is very sharp. He covered all the bases. 
The ethereal was covered by the heavenly scenes in the stained glass and the dreamy music of the chants. The aesthetics were most prominent in the architecture of the of the cathedrals themselves. Architectural wonders, to be sure. Satan knew marketing and how to appeal to the senses. And in case that didn't work, there was always the fear factor, which, unlike the television show of the same name, was all too real to these peasants and serfs. The fear of burning forever became part of their psyche. They did not question this. They did not dare. The word cathedral is a very telling word. It is derived from the Latin word cathedra, and it means throne. Now, whose thrones were they? Well, if you look up the words cathedral and cathedra, you will find definitions that look something like this. And these are from dictionary.com. <coughs> Excuse me. Cathedral, the principal church of a bishop's diocese containing the bishop's throne. Cathedra, a bishop's official chair or throne. What about our almighty heavenly father? Well, my Bible says in Isaiah 66, 1, Thus saith the Lord, the heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that ye build unto me? And where is the place of my rest? And what about the thrones of the saints? Revelation 2.10 says, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. The crowns and the thrones are supposed to come after death. We start to see how Satan set this whole thing up. Convince the people that they can see heaven on earth and actually enter into God's throne, which is occupied by the bishop, of course, and then have them pay dearly for the privilege. The stained glass windows are absolutely beautiful works of art. Some of them were built in the domes at the very top of the cathedrals so that the light would stream through onto the congregation. If you were to look up, it would be like looking heavenward and beholding God's glory. And yet God made it very clear in Exodus 20 verse 4 that he did not approve of the stained glass windows and statues of his son or angels or Mary or the apostles. When he commanded, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Satan's disguise was working better all the time. His church was boldly going against God's word and at the same time appearing as an angel of light. In the dark ages... Many thought that music uh, was a science and that it was magic. They thought if you played certain notes in a certain order, you could manipulate emotions in people. I think we can see how that would happen. I know I feel different if I'm listening to dark minor chords played slowly as opposed to when I'm listening to a lively upbeat number in the major scales. Satan knew he could use this to his advantage. Uh, the Gregorian chant, I, I, you probably know it, the, the one voice usually, and sometimes if they were all singing, it was in unison, and it was coming from the upper choir lofts, and it would kind of resonate, and it was kind of, it would kind of just flowed. Well, that style is called the Gregorian chant, and it's named after Pope Gregory I, who, by the way, did not invent it, write it, or sing it. He merely authorized it. Uh, which seems to fit the pattern of how things were starting to operate. Uh, it had no meter. And uh, originally it was not written music. The first forms of that music looked like this. And now imagine you're hearing this music in a large cathedral, which makes the sound resonate longer. The choir is up in the lofts on either side of this building. My music appreciation professor used to call this music otherworldly. This, of course, was all by design. Music evolved slowly, but very surely, and eventually the Gregorian chant was allowed some changes by the popes and bishops. Voices were added to the pieces, and harmonies were developing. But it wasn't until about 1170 that rhythm came into being. By the 1150s, 
Paris had become the intellectual and artistic capital of Europe, and it became the center of polyphonic music. Poly meaning many, and phonic meaning sound. The added voices and harmonies transformed the chants. But between 1170 and 1200, two composers from the school of Notre Dame in Paris developed rhythm. Okay, can we listen? That's probably good. So these two composers from the school of Notre Dame in Paris developed rhythm, and music and worship would never be the same. But here is the interesting part about that piece of history. In the beginning, the meter had to be in three. And why? Well, according to according to Roger Camion, author of Music and Appreciation, it was because it symbolized the Trinity. And this was kind of a compromise by the papal leaders. They fought the changes that were happening in music. They wanted to stick with the old Gregorian chants exclusively. Their formula for success had been working for centuries, and you know the old saying: "If it ain't broke, don't fix it." But they were learning the subtleties of marketing very slowly, and they finally accepted the inevitable, and in essence said. Now,、well, if we're going to allow meter, it will be in three. By this time in the Catholic、uh, history of the Catholic Church, it had a huge influence in the world. Composers were no exception. All the masters composed masses. Mass was a daily ritual, and music was a big part of it. The mass consisted of several parts. The one that is interesting to me is the Kyrie. It is the only part that was not in Latin. It was in Greek, but it was considered a most holy piece of music. Why? Guess because it had three parts, and each part was done three times. This was considered highly symbolic of the Trinity. The use of architecture, art, and music stimulated the natural senses, and Satan used these things very effectively. He brought heaven to earth. He was indeed appearing as an angel of light, and the masses (pun intended) were hooked. Now, as we have seen, Satan built the false church with his power and disguised that power as God's power, thus appearing as an angel of light. But there is another picture that shows Satan's power. First Peter five eight says, "Be sober." Be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. A roaring lion. A lion is a powerful animal, and Peter is warning us to be aware of the war of the roaring lion. And there's another lion mentioned in the scriptures, isn't there? The lion of the tribe of Judah. This lion is mentioned in Revelation 5:5. This was another way for Satan to disguise himself. If Jesus is the lion, then Satan would become a lion as well, and become a roaring lion. He did. The roaring of the papacy was heard around the world. Many cowered in fear, and many saints were tortured and killed by this roaring lion. The following is just one of a myriad of examples of how bold the Roaring Lion got. In the late 15th, early 16th centuries, after Spain had recently been liberated from Muslim power, it looked to the New World to continue building its empire. The following quotes are from a book called First Peoples. Quote: The Spanish. Believed they had a divine and royal mandate to reduce Indian peoples to submission. Spanish law required the conquistadors to read the Indians they encountered the requerimento. This document, worked out by theologians in, the, in 1513 at the request of the King of Spain, required Indians to acknowledge the Church as the ruler and superior of the whole world. The Pope. As high priest, if they did, the Spaniards would subquote receive you all in love and charity, leave you 
your wives and your children and your lands free without servitude. That last part sounds pretty good, but let's continue. If you don't do this and wickedly and intentionally delay to do so, I certify to you that with the help of God, we shall forcibly enter into your country and shall make war against you in all ways and manners that we can and shall subject you to the yoke and obedience of the church and of their highness. We shall take you and your wives and your children and shall make slaves of them and as such sell and dispose of them as their highness may command. And we protest that the deaths and losses which shall accrue from this are your fault and not that of their highness or ours, nor of these gentlemen who come with us. End subquotes. Read in Spanish to Indian people who understood neither its language nor its concepts, the Requiemento became little more than a ceremony of possession, allowing the Spaniards to justify conquest and any accompanying atrocities, end quote. And the atrocities were many, and they were horrible. Did that sound like your God? Did that sound like your brethren? There's an expression I believe aptly fits here. He who can make you believe absurdities can make you commit atrocities. And for sure, it wasn't always the papacy, as you can see. Satan made most of the world believe that the Pope was the vicar or substitute of Christ and that a loving God would torture forever those who would not comply with the church. That, my friends, was the absurdity. The requiremento and all that it implied was the atrocity, or at least one of many. The lion was roaring, and Satan's plan was working. But now we're going to see if there are any differences in the two lions, namely the roaring lion and the lion of the tribe of Judah, by looking at some behaviors of natural lions. According to the Cyber Zoo Mobile, when hunting, for the most part, If a lion misses his quarry on the initial charge, it does not give pursuit, but quits and looks for a new quarry. This quote proves to be a good picture for us in light of James 4.7. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. How in the world do we mere mortals resist the devil? The gazelle and the antelope use their God-given speed to run away as fast as they can. If they sense the lion soon enough, They will run to freedom and the lion will give up very quickly and go after other prey. What about us? We can't outrun the devil, but God has given us gifts as well. We can pray for strength to resist temptation. We can pray for increased faith. We can study our scriptures so that we know what to expect and have an answer ready at all times, just like Jesus had sound scriptural answers for Satan in his wilderness temptations. Satan did indeed flee from Jesus. We can also heed Hebrews 10.25 and meet, study, and pray together and warn each other as well. Believe it or not, according to the Cyber Zoo Mobile again, lions are not particularly efficient hunters, successfully capturing prey in only 20 to 30 percent of their attempts. And what is their problem? Well, besides giving up very quickly, it seems that lions do not hunt by scent, although their sense of smell is excellent. They often approach prey from an upwind location, thereby alerting the prey and ending the hunt. You see, God is so loving that he does not let Satan use all his power against us, just like the lion does not use all of his power when hunting. I really like that picture. Think about it. If Satan were given permission by God to use all his power against the church, the seed of Abraham would quickly be destroyed. Hebrews 2.14 says, Him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. Satan is powerful enough to just put you and me to death at his whim. But God will not let that happen. 
just like the case in Job. In Job 2.6, the Lord says to Satan, Very well then, he is in your hands, but you must spare his life. We know that Job was cursed with boils from head to toe, but Satan was not allowed to kill him. We are directly given that assurance as well in 1 John 5.18. He that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. That is to say that the roaring lion cannot just kill the human body that houses the new creature, even though he has the power to do so. Much the same as the actual lions cannot use their sense of smell to wipe out all of their prey. Brethren, I just find that truly refreshing. The last thing I will mention regarding the disguised lion is that lions often hunt in the night or very early morning. Many of the creatures that the lion hunts have very sharp eyesight, so hunting while it is still dark removes some of that advantage that the prey animals have in the day. This reminds me that, that we are in the dark night of sin, the gospel age now. It is still dark, and Satan, the roaring lion, is hunting aggressively. What is he hunting for? Satan and his minions, my dear brother, brethren, are hunting for you and for me. Dear brethren, keep yourselves in the love of God. And now, what about the other lion? the lion of the tribe of Judah. How is this lion different from the roaring, devouring lion? What is there about lions that would make us think about our Lord Jesus Christ? Well, there's something uh, about lions I found very interesting. Mating lions do not usually show any interest in hunting or eating and are not generally viewed as a threat by prey species. Think about what our Lord did after he was crucified and subsequently resurrected. Acts 15.14 says this, Simeon hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. In other words, the church class or bride class was being developed. One might say that a mate was being developed for Christ. During this gospel age, Satan has had free reign over the world of mankind. Satan, as the eventual prey of our Lord, has not needed to concern himself about the lion of the tribe of Judah during the gospel age. However, my guess is that uh, Satan, is, Satan is starting to get very concerned now that our Lord has returned. We also read about the lion of the tribe of Judah in Genesis 49, 9 and 10. From the Leaser translation, it reads this way. Like a lion's whelp, O Judah, from the prey, my son, thou risest. A whelp is a cub. And in the case of Judah, the cub has yet to reach maturity. But out of that seed came the true lion of the tribe. The lion seems to fit beautifully as a symbol of our Lord and of Satan. But one is an imposter. One is in disguise. One is masquerading. Satan knew that the Messiah would come to Israel. He also knew that Israel was expecting a mature lion, one who would take control immediately. But Israel did not get a lion or even a lion's cub. What Israel got was a lamb, a sacrificial lamb. Israel didn't want a lamb. Israel wanted a lion, a great and powerful charismatic leader. Israel killed the lamb. Satan watched this with high interest, I believe. He surmised that if Israel wanted a lion, this new thing called Christianity, they're going to want a lion as well. He was right, and he built an empire from that idea. Satan, by becoming a lion, appeared as an angel of light. His disguise was so good that he was revered as the lion and the true light through his earthly representatives. As we mentioned earlier, Satan was not interested in God's love or God's mercy. If he had been, he would have known that the meek and gentle lion had to come first and the ruling lion would follow. When did Jesus become the lion? 
Matthew 28, 18 says, And Jesus came unto them and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. This was given to him after he was resurrected. How about before that? Did he have any power as a lamb? John 8, 28, I do nothing on my own, but speak just what the Father has taught me. Does a little lamb have any power? Well, a lamb has the power to feed, but only when killed. And so it was that the Lamb of God died and is to this day feeding his followers. The masquerading lion's power will be completely destroyed. But what about the lamb? Is the lamb gone forever since it has become a lion, so to speak? Well, we need look no further than the book of Revelation to get our answer. Revelation 19.7 talks about the marriage of the lamb. Revelation 21.9 mentions the lamb's wife. And we read in Revelation 22, 3, And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. These all refer to future time. So will Jesus be a lion or a lamb in the kingdom? Well, there's some scriptures that address this. And one of them is Isaiah 11:6. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together. Carnivores that, carnivores that hunt and eat animals are pictured here in the kingdom, dwelling with what would normally be their prey. And I think this is the whole point. In the kingdom, Christ will be the lion of the tribe of Judah, but he will also display the gentle traits that we usually attach to the prey animals like the lamb. He will be the conquering king, the one who rules the kingdom with a rod of iron and will lay judgment to the line and righteousness to the plummet. He will also be the sympathetic high priest, the one who teaches righteousness and judges with justice and mercy. This is a concept that has totally eluded Satan. He wanted power and he could care less about lamb-like things like love, mercy, patience, meekness, kindness. We must develop lamb-like traits in order to sit with the lamb on his throne. Lucifer lost his position as the morning star because he wanted power and was totally clueless of the lamb-like qualities. Whereas Jesus understood that in order to become the lion of the tribe of Judah, he must first become a sacrificial lamb. And Jesus became the morning star because he fully developed those lamb-like qualities. Revelation 22.16 says, I am the root and offspring of David and the bright and morning star. He earned that position. Satan lost it. Before we conclude, I'm going to give you a very quick and easy test. Please see me after class if you want your grade. And I want you to take a look at these couple of pictures. Who can tell me which of these rivers is the darkest? Nobody has their glasses on. This is not a trick. This is not a trick question. Obviously, the one on the left is darker. Now, back in the days when I was a sport fisherman, I was very tuned into what we call the shape of a river. If a river was muddy from too much rain, we said, oh, it's out of shape would not be able to fish it because the fish wouldn't be able to see our our lures. And any time we drove over a muddy river, we would say, ah, the river is dark, too dark to fish. One day I was driving over a bridge with someone who did not fish, and I said, ooh, the river is really dark today. The person with me said, don't you mean light? I had to chuckle at myself and do some explaining. You see, the light from above reflects off the muddy water, and it appears to those looking at it to be a light grayish-brown color. However... If you're to be immersed in the water and we're trying to see, the picture on your lower right is about what you would see, basically nothing. You see, almost all of the light from the sun is reflected off the particles in the water and visibility below is terrible. Under the water, it's dark. Whereas when the water is clear, most of the light does not reflect away. It penetrates the water from above the surface, and so it often appears dark green in the deeper sections. This underwater photo reveals how clear the river on the left is. The light from the sun has penetrated the surface and illuminated the things in the water. Visibility is very good. Brethren, the angel of light makes his muddy water to appear as light. But when one dives into those false doctrines, how poor the visibility is, because the true light from God cannot penetrate all the mud in the water. And when the visibility is poor, things are very confusing. 
you know, we don't care what outside observers think they see. If they jump into the muddy waters, it's going to be very hard for them to see even just a little of God's marvelous plan. Brethren, we are interested only in clear, pure waters of truth. The clear water that welcomes God's pure light and does not reflect it away. And how blessed we are to be able to see God's plan with his true light. How blessed we are to have a relationship with the lion of the tribe of Judah. I thank the Lord every day that he has allowed me to see these precious truths of his plan. How blessed we are to clearly see the doctrines of ransom, restitution, redemption, resurrection, and perfect life that will eventually come to all the families of the earth, right here on the earth. How blessed we are to know that the one who disguises himself as an angel of light will deceive the nations for only a short time more. And may the Lord add his blessing.